What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a look at another very interesting organized crime topic. And over the years, one of the most violent individuals in the history of the mob is Anthony Gaspipe Casso. We've heard as many stories, silencing witnesses, family members of witnesses, and other people that were connected to the mafia. But not a lot's known about his mentor in the life. A man who by 19 was a convicted gang rapist. He ultimately would become a high-ranking member of the Lucchese crime family and take over as consigliere in the 80s. The story of Christopher, Christy Tick Funari, next on Sit Down Shorts. Christopher Funari was born April 30th, 1924, in Gravesend, Brooklyn. If you know anything about Gravesend, it is in South Brooklyn, not far away from the neighborhood of Bensonhurst. It was said that Funari's parents were from the northeastern area of Sicily, known as Messina, not far from Calabria, and his family would come over before he was born. Now, for Christy Tick, um, he would grow up really with a pretty nondescript home life, uh, but by his mid-teens, he was hustling classmates and very much involved in loan sharking. It was estimated that Christy Tick was making hundreds of dollars a week uh, as a loan shark, making cash off his classmates. Now, he would grow up at 1935 West 7th Street in Gravesend. Now, for Christy Tick Funari, by 1943, he was running the streets with his friends and became involved with several women. He and his two friends um, would set up a date to meet these women in Coney Island. Now, for Christy Tick Funari, that night, he and his two friends, an individual called Nunzio Morone, 22, of 2523 West Street, and his other friend, John Tallini, 21, of 2476 85th Street, apparently drove uh, to the uh, beach area of Coney Island to pick up three women. Uh, they would pick up the women in, a, in their car and take them to an area of Canarsie where it was said they were going to take them out to eat. Uh, during the travel to the restaurant, the car would veer off uh, near Canarsie Creek in Brooklyn. Now, uh, subsequently, the three individuals, Tallini, Marone, and Fernare, would force themselves upon the three women. Uh, during this situation, they attempted to gang rape all three of the women. During this attempted assault, one of the women got away and ran into and jumped into Canarsie Creek and would hide there for hours. The other two women were badly beaten including one who had a broken and fractured jaw. These three men would escape, and the woman that was beaten up uh, and escaped into Canarsie Creek alongside with the other two women would report it to the police. The King's DA wanted these three individuals, and they were ultimately arrested. For Christy Tick, uh, he was only 19 years old in 1943, and him and his two friends had to face the fact that they were going to have to face a jury in this very serious trial, uh, in uh, November of 1943, a jury of their peers would find all three teens guilty of attempted rape and second-degree assault charges. A Brooklyn judge late that year would sentence Christopher Funari to 15 to 30 years in state prison. His other two cohorts would get longer prison sentences, and they would all head off. Funari would head up to Sing Sing. He had to face the facts that over the next 15 or so years, he would be behind the wall. But as we know, for kids that are connected to the mafia, they become better criminals behind the wall. And that's exactly what would happen. Fernari would be released in 1956, but he had already set up plenty of connections uh, during his time in prison. Before his time in prison, it was said that he began to be somewhat close to future powerhouse Tony Ducks Corallo. For Fernari, things were good. Even though he was a gang rapist, an attempted gang rapist, uh, he had a lot of connections. And due to the fact that he was making money through loan sharking and bookmaking, he was the perfect person 
to be involved with the mafia. During the late 50s, right before the books were closed in the mafia, it was said that in 1957, Christy Tikfunari became a made member of the Lucchese crime family. Now, for uh, Christy Tick, he also maintained connections with other members of other families, including a high-ranking individual in the Colombo family, Joe Magliaccio. At one point, as we know, Joe Magliaccio would get into a heated war with uh, members of the uh, Gallo crew, including Joey Gallo and his two brothers. Now, during the late 50s, early 60s, uh, Christy Tick maintained a very close relationship with Joe Magliaccio. At one point, it was alleged that uh, Magliaccio ordered Christy Tick to take out uh, the Gallo brothers. At one point, it was actually uncovered that after uh, Mr. Funari uh, was out on parole, he was arrested for violating pro after he met with a Migliaccio soldier. During an uh, interrogation from a member of the law enforcement party, Funari was uh, filed with contempt after agents were rifling through his belongings and discovered photographs of the Gallo brothers hidden inside a Bible. At one point, Christy Tick was asked, what's up with the photo? Tick would respond, quote, I sell life insurance policies. And my boss gave me those pictures. He told me to avoid selling life insurance policies to those guys. They might not be living much longer. So he had those photos for a reason and made a very sarcastic joke when asked about it. But it's a very interesting connection that Christy Tick Funari had with other members of the Colombo crime family. As we know, though, he never ended up killing the Gallo brothers. But there was a wonder that maybe at one point he did. For Christy Tick, he was a made man. And by 1962, the early 1960s, Christy Tick would be made a captain in the Lucchese crime family. Now, most of the uh, comings and goings for the Lucchese was centered in Brooklyn and in Manhattan also in uh, the Bronx. In Brooklyn, Christy Tick made up a very lucrative crew, uh, which was very big in loan sharking and gambling. And a lot of their money was coming in off the Brooklyn docks. And that's where ultimately uh, Christy Tick would meet up with Anthony Casso and he'd become a high-ranking associate of Christy Tick. But for Fernari, he would run all of his operations out of the 19th hole social club in Diker Heights, Brooklyn at the corner of 86th Street and 14th Avenue in Diker Heights. It was also said at one point that Christy Tick Funari was very big in heroin and made a lot of money in that very lucrative racket. As we know, if you know anything about the Lucchese crime family, they were integral in the drug market, including having some of the biggest powerhouses in heroin in their family, including Joe Beck Di Palermo and Big John Ormento. Now, one of the other things that... Uh, Christy Tick Funari was getting very much involved with was unions. And if you know anything about the Lucchese crime family, this goes back to the change in name between the Reina family to Lucchese family. Tommy Lucchese was integral in unions. Him and his partner, Johnny Dio, as well as Tony Ducks Corallo were in, integral in labor racketeering and union infiltration. Christy Tick was no different. He would become quickly involved with the International Brotherhood and Union of Painters and Allied Trades. Basically, Tony uh, Corallo and people like Christy Tick controlled over 6,000 painters in New York, men that were uh, important in painting bridges, subway stations, hotels, anything that mattered, Christy Tick had control. Now, he had control through an individual seen here on the bottom right, James Bishop, who is the treasurer of that union. He also had an individual named Frank Arnold in his pocket that was part of the uh, International Brotherhood of Painters as well. Keep in mind, every job that was done, the mafia and Christy Tick got a piece of it. This was a huge amount of money. And this was something that, to me, really between the 60s into the early 90s, the Lucchese and Genovese crime families were incredibly astute at getting into labor racketeering and unions. That's how they made big time money. Keep in mind, Christy Tick was also very involved in concrete uh, and other things of that nature. The building trades were on lock through people like Christy Tick.
Funari. Now, during uh, his uh, reign of terror, um, not only did he control unions, but as I said, very involved with extortion, bookmaking, loan sharking, and a lot of the overseeing of debt collection would be through his protege, Anthony Gaspipe Casso. Casso would come up in the crew of Mr. Funari, and he would meet Funari uh, through Brooklyn Connects. And Funari, not only him, but Victor Amuso as well, would handle the day-to-day -day collections. And they would ultimately become very integral in a group called the Bypass Gang that Funari oversaw. Basically, the Bypass Gang was headed by Amuso and Casso. And what they did was they set up a... Uh, transcendent group of bank robbers, uh, uh, safe uh, breakers, locksmiths, all sorts of different people. And they were credited in by authorities stealing up to $100 million from safe deposit boxes and other uh, valuables. This was a huge money-making operation as well. And it was all overseen by Funari. Funari really goes down as one of the biggest earners really ever in and really one of the more powerful people ever in the Lucchese crime family. One of the things that also Gaspipe Casso did on behalf of Mr. Funari is kill people. Gaspipe uh, was credited in 1972 for killing a man called Lee Scheifler. Now, Scheifler was a drug dealer that was connected to Funari at one point. It was alleged that Mr. Scheifler was a rat. Casso would kill him. Uh, now, Casso would ultimately become a made man in 1974, and he would be sponsored by his mentor, Christy Tick Funari. Now, as we also know, the, the bypass crew was um, wanted in all sorts of, of different burglaries, including the 1972 robbery at the Pierre Hotel, which is credited as one of the biggest hotel robberies in the history of this country. Funari was a big timer. He was making a lot of money, and he would get called in 1981 – for a different job, he would be elevated to consigliere in the Lucchese crime family. He was third in command behind the boss, Tony Ducks Corallo, and underboss, Salvatore Tom Mick Santoro. Now, Salvatore Tom Mick Santoro and Christy Tick were, again, very integral in the day-to-day -day representation for the Lucchese crime family on the commission. Remember, Tony Ducks was very much insulated, okay? He had a lot of conversations in the Jaguar and things of that nature. But again, a lot of the day-to-day -day commission uh, business was actually run through Santoro and Christy Tick, including a conversation uh, in January of 1984 between Funari, Tom Mick Santoro, and Fat Tony Salerno. At one point, they're discussing basically that Bonanno boss Philip Rusty Ristelli can be the boss, but he is not allowed on the commission. At one point, Salerno would be quoted as saying, quote, he can never be on the commission. Uh, and then again, this was the thing that uh, Christy Tick was involved with. He was involved with very big time decisions. He was a very much important uh, high ranking member of this family and really had tons of control. Keep in mind as well, he would discuss day to day runnings of the Lucchese crime family with uh, Tony Ducks Corallo and his driver and capo, Salvatore Avellino. As we know, Avellino would chauffeur uh, Tony Ducks and Tom Mix, um, basically the meetings and that sort of thing. At one point, Funari was heard on wiretap one time inside the Jaguar where he basically said, quote, yeah, that's right, in response to silencing potential witnesses. This would come back to bite Christy Tick Funari. That one conversation would definitely come back to bite him. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. In 1985, Christy Tick Funari alongside Tony Ducks Corallo, Tom Mick Santoro, Fat Tony Salerno, and other members of the mafia were indicted in what can be called the commission case. We all know about the commission case. And I'll do a video at some point really detailing all the people involved in this case. Um, that uh, little stunt on wiretap really hurt Christy Tech. He would be indicted on multiple counts, including the RICO conspiracy, bid rigging, extortion, murder, and other crimes. Now, for Christy Tick, he would actually get an over a million dollar bail and be out on the street. At one point when he took, went to trial on the commission case, he would make a comment, quote, when the tape was played at trial, he would say, one fucking ride in that fucking car. And I'm sitting here fucked. 
That was the big issue. The wiretaps killed Fernari because in the end, that's a lot of how the government was able to wrangle up all these members. Speaking on tape, that Jaguar bug killed a lot of people, including Tony Ducks and, and, and Tom Mix and other guys. For Fernari, though, he was out on bail. And, and importantly enough, before he would go away, he would actually uh, oversee and be a major peacekeeper in a brewing situation that was being uh, dealt with through Anthony Gaspipe Casso, as we've heard many times from former Colombo uh, Kappa regime, Michael Franzese, he takes credit in basically creating something called the gas tax scheme. And we've all heard about this. The mob was basically siphoning off, um, you know, a percentage of every gallon of gasoline that was sold in New York. And they were making millions of dollars per week. Um, the actual originator of the scheme was this individual, Marit Balagula, a Russian a gangster who was really credited at creating the scheme. He would go really into business with not only Christy Tick, but Anthony Gaspipe Casso. And Christy Tick was very much instrumental in really figuring out this whole thing. Um, if we remember, Gaspipe Casso obviously was approached by Balagula uh, in this whole scheme. And he would then go to uh, Funari, where basically they would discuss that Balagula was now with them. And if he had any problems, they could come to him. Fernari would basically state as well that everybody can eat off this and we're not going to create a war over being too greedy. Every family can be involved with this scheme. And that's eventually where Franzese was brought in on all this. And he had his own connection. Everybody made money off the gas tax scheme. But Funari was integral in making sure that a war didn't break out between people like Franzese and the Columbos and other members of the family. Funari realized it's better to be free and let everybody earn instead of being greedy and you only earning. That was a very smart thing by Funari. Funari was a smart guy at the end of the day. Um, he made a lot of money. He was very powerful. And he was able to really cool the heels a lot of the time of Anthony Casso. Uh, during his uh, subsequent commission case, he would actually ask uh, Anthony Casso to take over uh, as the boss of the family. Um, but he declined. And as we know, Vic Musa would become boss. Casso would be the underboss. For Fernari, though, he would have to face the prospect that he was likely going to go to prison for a long time. We have to wonder, though, when you look at the case of the commission, Tony uh, Corallo obviously had major issues being the boss. But Chris um, Funari really, as far as the Galanta hit, which was instrumental in this, he really didn't have much connection to that. Um, and probably shouldn't have faced the 100 years that he did. But in September of 1986, he would go to trial alongside Tom Mix and Tony Salerno. In November of 1986, Christy Tick was convicted on all counts. And in early 1987, would receive 100 years in federal prison with no parole. Now, remember, he would be convicted in 1986. This was a very important thing because in 1987, federal parole was eliminated, but anyone before 1986 was given parole. Okay, so Christy Tick would fight this for a long period of time. Over 20 years, he would spend in federal prison. He would challenge the no parole. Court would continue to deny his motions, and his release date was... 2044, effectively a life sentence. He'd be 120 years old if he were able to make it to that point. However, it was found, though, that through the Federal Parole Act being eliminated before or after he was convicted, he would be eligible for parole. Christy Tick would finally be released from prison in 2014 after serving 28 years in the can. He was in his 90s at this point. But remember this. He would be one of the only people convicted in the commission trial to die in his own home. In May of 2018, Christy Tick Funari would die of natural causes at his home in Staten Island. The only other individual involved in this case beside Christy Tick was Bruno and Delicata, who would ultimately be released, head back, and was just released again. Christy Tick was a fascinating individual, and he would die in his 90s. In his own bed. Remember that, folks. He is a fascinating individual. He is a lethal and violent individual, a man that stole, plundered, killed people, and also 
attempted to gang rape young women. Remember that. Uh, he's one of the only people to be convicted of that crime. Weirdly enough, family member connected to him as well. Paul Vario was convicted of a gang rape as well, uh, or a rape as well. So this, again, did not preclude Christy Tick from being involved in the mafia. And when we look at his career in the mob, he was a very accomplished individual. One of the lost people in the Lucchese crime family. But as I've talked about time and time again, we remember the gas pipes and the Tony Ducks. But it was people like Christy Tick who, during the 70s and 80s, made the Lucchese crime family one of the most powerful criminal entities in this country. As always, if you enjoy this video, make sure you hit the like button. And so you never miss a video, make sure you subscribe below. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.